Hi there, and welcome to the Laboratory Evaluation of Hemoglobinopathies. I'm Dr. Alex, and I have recorded this thing about five times now because I want it to make sense. And I want you to think about hemoglobinopathies as they are, not all of the biochemistry and um, detailed genetics and how many of this chain and that chain and all that stuff. What I'm really interested in at this very basic clinical laboratory diagnosis introductory level is that you understand what those hemoglobinopathies mean clinically, that you understand something about how the patient gets them or the person gets them, and that you understand what your role is as a primary care doctor in managing, first diagnosing and then managing the hemoglobinopathies that might present in patients um, in your practice. So let's define hemoglobinopathy. Hemoglobinopathy, as we said, is an inherited blood disorder in which something went wrong. You either have an abnormal form or a decreased production of hemoglobin. So we're either talking about affecting the structure or the production of the globin. And how does this compare to anemia? Well, it is an anemia. Erythrocytic issues and disorders. Okay, hemoglobinopathies are categorically anemias that have a malfunction in the hemoglobin. Focus there for a second on the hemoglobin slide. What's our hemoglobin primary function? Well, it carries oxygen and CO2. And you can recall the structure from biochemistry. You've got some alpha chains and some beta chains, and you've got the heme group in there. And this is, you know, how many molecules of oxygen can be carried and all that kind of stuff. This slide is just asking you to recall the importance of hemoglobin. So what's considered a hemoglobinopathy? Well, for now, what I'm interested in you knowing is alpha and beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So alpha and beta th thalassemia? Alpha and beta thalassemias are, if you look at this picture... Conditions in which we started with an erythroblast, and then for whatever reason, something went wrong. And now we have excess beta chains or excess alpha chains. And we have these conditions called alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia, based on the, the, the nomenclature. The name is based on how many of which they have or don't have in terms of their alpha or beta chains. And the rest of this slide is just asking you to recall the hematology slide where you were introduced to inclusion bodies, Heinz bodies, and Howell Jolly bodies. There's another couple of slides, blood smears for thalassemias. And a reminder that the th thalassemia syndromes are indeed a group of inherited anemias that are characterized by defects in the synthesis of one or more of the globin chain subunits of that hemoglobin tetramer. So let's go back and look at the hemoglobin tetramer. There it is. One or more of those globin chain subunits is defective. Okay. The clinical syndromes associated with thalassemia arise then from the combined consequences of both the inadequate hemoglobin production and the imbalanced accumulation of those subunits. And so if we look at the above the above left slide, we see thalassemia trait, hypochromic microcytic red blood cells with frequent targeting and mild anemia. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the above right, we see the homozygous beta thalassemia. <coughs> Excuse me. And you'll note that there are some bizarre target cells, some Howell Jolly bodies, and the poorly hemoglobinized nucleated red blood cells are seen as well. So what's the clinical picture? Well, inadequate hemoglobin production causes this hypochromia and microcytosis. Let's go back to the last slide. Hypochromia and microcytosis, upper left there. Imbalanced accumulation of globin subunits then leads to ineffective erythropoiesis and then hemo hemolytic anemia, destruction. So what types of hemoglobin disease are we looking at here? We're looking at something called hemoglobin C, hemoglobin SC, sickle cell anemia, and then various types of thalassemia. This slide is really awesome. If you spend some time studying it, you'll see the normal 
erythroblast on the left there. That's um, normal as defined by alpha 2, beta 2, hemoglobin A's. And then if we have a reduced beta globin synthesis with relative excess of alpha globin, okay, so we're reducing the beta globin synthesis, which is by definition going to give us, if we don't change the alpha globin, a relative excess of alpha globin. And now we have what's called beta thalassemia. So we have this insoluble alpha globin aggregate with our hemoglobin A, and that gives us what's called an abnormal erythroblast. It, it's not right. And then if you follow it down to the, the bone cartoon there, you can see it goes two possible paths. Few abnormal cells, red cells actually leave, and then you have that alpha globin aggregate on your normal hemoglobin A with a hypochromic cell because it's hypochromic. Well, hopefully you know by now why it's hypochromic if we think of it and think of what is hypochromic defined as. And then that cell gets taken out by the spleen. Destruction of the aggregate containing the red cells in the spleen. And you see the alpha globin aggregate that they're talking about there. And so this causes anemia. And if we follow that anemia on down, we see tissue and anoxia, or not enough oxygen, and erythropoietin increases, as we talked about in class, in response to this. And now we've got skeletal deformities because the bone marrow is expanding. The bone marrow is expanding to try to increase the red blood cell count, to increase erythropoietin. Okay, and then you can also see on the left here where systemic iron overload or secondary hemochromatosis to destruction occurs, and we end up with problems of end organs as a result. So how do we test for these? Well, it's a blood test. So it's a, a hemoglobinopathy evaluation is just a group of tests that identifies the abnormal forms or suggests problems with production of hemoglobin in order to screen for or diagnose the disorder. So what's hemoglobin again? So hopefully by now you know it's the iron-containing protein found in all red blood cells that binds to oxygen in the lungs and allows the red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout the body and deliver it to the cells and tissues. Okay, and those globin chains, depending on their structure, have different designations, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And then the type of that globin chain um, is important because that's how it you know, determines how it functions and its ability to transport oxygen. So there's a cartoon representation of those four monomeric polypeptides, the four heme groups bound together. We have uh, the alpha, beta, delta, and gamma globulin proteins. And normal hemoglobin looks like hemoglobin A, which is 95 to 98% of hemoglobin, and that's two alphas and two betas. So there's our normal hemoglobin. We also have hemoglobin A2 that's normal hemoglobin. That makes up 2 to 3% of hemoglobin in adults, and it's got two alphas and two deltas, whereas our fetal hemoglobin, or hemoglobin F, 1 to 2% of the hemoglobin in adults, and has two alphas and two gammas. So that fetal hemoglobin is the primary hemoglobin produced by the fetus during pregnancy, and its production falls off after birth and reaches adult levels by one to two years. So if we look again at what happens from fetal development to when that fetus is actually a baby, hemoglobin F, a normal type of hemoglobin, is, as we said, the predominant hemoglobin, and then shortly after the baby becomes a baby, i.e. it's born, it's replaced by hemoglobin A. And then there are other variants. F, A, and A2 are our typical types, but we can get uh, mutations or variants. And many variants have been identified, but the ones we're talking about include hemoglobin S for sickle cell, hemoglobin C, and hemoglobin E. So we can see when hemoglobin goes wrong, there's a slide of sickle cell. Okay, and so we might see that genetic mutations in those globin genes cause alterations in the globin protein. And that's how we get our structurally altered hemoglobin, or hemoglobin S. A decrease in the globin chain production, as we said, is going to push towards an imbalance in the alpha and beta chains, and we're going to end up with something that we call thalassemia. And again, we'll define that as the reduced production of one of the globin chains 
that upsets the balance of the other one. So we have reduced production of one of the globin chains upsets the balance of alpha to beta chains and causes abnormal hemoglobin to form. That would be your alpha thalassemia or causes an increase in the minor hemoglobin components, such as the HbA2 or HbF. So what we said before on the previous slide, that hemoglobin A2 and hemoglobin F are 2 to 3% and 1 to 2%, but if that balance gets upset, now we have too much of those, and that's called beta thalassemia. So these genetic changes can, as stated, result in reduced proportion of one of the normal globin chains or in the production of structurally altered globin chains. So the presence of abnormal hemoglobin within red blood cells alter the appearance, size and shape. So that's what we see on the blood smear, but they also alter the function. And red blood cells that have this abnormal hemoglobin may, we'll read that likely, not carry oxygen efficiently, or they may be broken down sooner. They may get taken out of circulation sooner, resulting in hemolytic anemia. And the one that we're going to focus the most on is hemoglobin S, the variant that's called hemoglobin S, and that's the primary hemoglobin present in people with sickle cell disease. It causes the red blood cells to become misshapen or sickle, which decreases the cell survival. Hemoglobin C can cause minor amounts of hemolytic anemia, that's another variant, and hemoglobin E can cause no symptoms or just mild symptoms. So, but the sickling one, hemoglobin S, <clears throat> excuse me, is so prevalent that it affects approximately one in every 500 African American babies. That's a lot. More than 70,000 Americans live with this disorder. Those who have hemoglobin S disease have two abnormal beta chains and two normal alpha chains. The presence of the hemoglobin S causes that red cell to deform and assume a sickle shape when it's exposed to decreased amounts of oxygen, like when you're exercising or when you have an infection. So sickle cell trait or disease both offer protective effects against malaria. Um, that's kind of a random fact, but it's an interesting one if you're into genetics and you want to study um, why that might be. So that's led to positive selection of, of the genetic mutation. So again, with hemoglobin S, we end up with sickled red cells, and they're blocking blood vessels, and they cause pain and impaired circulation, and you don't get enough oxygen, and that shortens the survival, and they get taken out, and there's hemolytic anemia, and it's very, very horrible. So a single beta S copy known as sickle cell trait is present in about 8% of African Americans, but it rarely causes significant symptoms. But when you combine that with another hemoglobin mutation, such as the one causing hemoglobin C or beta thalassemia, then you've got something that's going to cause problems, potentially. So a person who has one normal hemoglobin gene copy and one hemoglobin S copy is going to produce about 40% hemoglobin S. But they're going to produce enough hemoglobin A, remember what hemoglobin A is, the normal one, they're going to produce enough of that that you don't generally see any significant health problems in those people until there's times of stress. The single, al the single altered copy, which is in genetic terms heterozygous, is called sickle cell trait. And where it can be problematic other than times of stress for the individual who possesses it is that it can be passed on to children. And you can see uh, the, do they call that penetrance when you see it expressed in genetics? I can't really remember. You can see what's happening there. We have um, an unaffected carrier mom and dad, and they end up with um, with a whole bunch of not affected, but a lot of carriers, and then one in four children are going to actually have um, be affected by it, not just carriers. Okay, so when a person has two copies of the altered gene, they're homozygous, and that person produces 80 to 90% of hemoglobin S and absolutely no normal hemoglobin A. They have sickle cell anemia, and symptoms and con um, complications of sickle cell anemia may also be experienced, or sickle cell disease, I should say, by those who have a single gene copy and one gene copy for so, like any other hemoglobin variant. So they might be, um, let's say they have the sickle cell gene copy, one, and then they have um, hemoglobin C, or uh, we'll, we'll just say in this case hemoglobin C. They are doubly heterozygous. So now they can also have problems. So here is where this might be a problem. Inheritance of hemoglobin SC. So they've got the sickle and the C. And a person can 
um, inherit those two different abnormal genes, one from each parent, which would be called doubly heterozygous. And they can have clinically significant combinations that occur. Like hemoglobin S or hemoglobin C alone wouldn't be that bad of a combination. I mean, I, you know, I don't prefer that for anybody. But if you have to have something, and you, can't, you don't have a choice, you've got to pick one, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as worried about them having one copy, but to have both of them together, now we call that hemoglobin SC disease, where they get one beta S and one beta C, and that results in hemoglobin SC. And these individuals have a mild hemolytic anemia and moderate enlargement of the spleen. And persons with hemoglobin SC disease may develop the same blood blocking, blood vessel blocking complications as those who have sickle cell anemia. It's just less severe in most cases. So what's thalassemia? Well, thalassemia, another anemia, is a condition, again, where the gene mutation resulted in a reduced production of one of the globin chains. And the apple cart is upset. And that apple cart is the balance of alpha to beta chains. So we end up with abnormal hemoglobin, and that would be alpha thalassemia, or an increase in minor hemoglobin components, like, as we said earlier, that hemoglobin A2 or the hemoglobin F, which is normally only 2 to 3 and 1 to 2 percent. We end up with too much of those. Now we got beta thalassemia. So there's lots of other variants, but we're not going to talk about those. Alpha thalassemia, these are just some kind of nice-to-know facts about alpha thalassemia, but they result from mutations that cause decreased synthesis of structurally normal globin. Okay, and then beta thalassemia, there's only one beta globin gene, of which there are two alleles. So the globin chain synthesis in the homozygous state reveals two major types. And we have the beta plus, where they have suboptimal beta chains, and the beta zero, which is total absence of beta chains. And there's also delta, beta, thalassemia, gamma, delta, beta, thalassemia, and then hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. I'm not going to go into those. You can read about them if you want to, but they're not, I'm not going to use them for the scope of this class. Screening. So screening for these disorders is done when the baby is a newborn. You can also do prenatal screening. And you can do asymptomatic, asymptomatic parents of affected child screening. And you can do screening for unexplained causes of anemia. The laboratory testing for hemoglobin variants is an exploration of the normalness, for lack of a better word, of an individual's red blood cells. It's an evaluation of the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells or analysis of the relevant gene mutations. So we can look at a CBC with differential and a blood smear or we can run genetics tests. But each test provides a piece of the puzzle. And so that's going to give you, the doctor, important information about the hemoglobins that may be present. Testing typically includes the following. CBC, blood smear, iron studies, and a hemoglobinopathy evaluation. For thalassemia, you're going to do a CBC, a blood smear, iron studies, and this hemoglobinopathy eval. And the CBC is going to be, as we know, the snapshot of the cells circulating in the blood. How many red blood cells are present? How much hemoglobin's in them? What's the average shape and size? The mean corpuscular volume, that's the measurement of the size of the red blood cells. So a low MCV is often the first indication of thalassemia. If the MCV is low and the iron deficiency anemia has been ruled out, the person may be a carrier of the thalassemia trait or have a hemoglobin variant that results in smaller than normal red blood cells. The blood smear, also, excuse me, also called the peripheral smear, with a hemoglobinopathy, the red blood cells may be smaller than normal, paler than normal, varying in sizes, that's our anisocytosis, big RDW, and shape, poikilocytosis, so we've got our sickle cells. They may have a nucleus. It's a nucleated red blood cell, but it's not normal in a mature red blood cell. They may have uneven hemoglobin distribution, which makes them look like targets or bullseyes under the microscope. Isn't it nice to know why those things are targeted? It's just an uneven hemoglobin distribution. And the greater the percentage of abnormal-looking red cells, the greater the likelihood there's an underlying disease. So look above at the blood smear and note that there's peripheral blood, red blood cell morphologic features of 
the following, and I know you can read this, but I just want to point out there's a minor population of microcytic hypochromic erythrocytes, and there's also a mild anisopoikilocytosis. So we just combine those worlds, those words and worlds, Brangelina, anisopoikilocytosis, and we also have some scattered elliptocytes and dacrocytes. Iron studies. Well, the iron studies may include iron, ferritin, unsaturated iron binding capacity, or total iron binding capacity, and percent saturation of transferrin. And these tests measure different aspects of the body's iron storage and usage. They're ordered to help determine whether an iron deficiency anemia is causing and or exacerbating the person's anemia. But low iron stores are not usually thalassemia. So that's a tip for you to remember. Hemoglobinopathy evaluation, what does that mean? Well, these are tests that identify the type and measure the relative amount of the different type of hemoglobin present in the individual's red blood cells. It's usually a hemoglobin electrophoresis. Most of the common variants can be identified using one of these tests or some combination of them and the relative amounts of any variant hemoglobin detected can help diagnose combinations of the hemoglobin variants and of thalassemias. Hemoglobin A is composed of both alpha and beta, and it's the normal type of hemoglobin found in adults, and a greater percentage of hemoglobin A2 and or F is usually seen in beta thalassemia trait. Hemoglobin H may be seen in alpha thalassemia due to hemoglobin H disease. And if that didn't make sense to you, go back and read it again. Because really all it is telling you is that, which we've already said about four times, that hemoglobin A is normal. It's the alpha and beta globin chains. It's got the high percentage, 92, 93 to 95%, I believe. Is it 92 to 95 or 93 to 98? Anyway, it's in the high 90s. That's the normal type of hemoglobin found in adults. That hemoglobin A2 and F are also normal. But when they are in too large of a percentage, it's over the 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 that we should be seeing them in, now we have beta thalassemia trait. Okay, so we shouldn't see those things out of their percentages. It's sort of like the white blood cells, the never let monkeys eat bananas. If our bananas are higher than our let, then we have too many bananas in our white blood cells, too many basophils. The next slide talks to you a little bit about Beta thalassemia major, beta thalassemia intermedia, and beta thalassemia minor. And it, you can see the severity of the disease arrow goes up on the right column there as we start with minor going to major. And we notice that beta thalassemia minor is a heterozygous condition. So you've just got one of those things. It's asymptomatic and it may require some genetic counseling. But if we have intermedia, now we've got some varying genetic interactions and the globin chain production is moderately impaired, and we've got some mild anemia that's diagnosed late in childhood, and occasionally blood transfusions are required. But when we get to beta thalassemia, now it's a homozygous disorder. We, we, we were double whammied. And significant imbalance of alpha and beta globin chains. And the severe anemia presents early in life and requires lifelong red blood cell transfusion, and if untreated, you're going to die in your first decade of life. It's just the facts. Okay, and then figure A there, let's see, clinical classification, that's the top one. Figure B, tentative criteria to differentiate thalassemia major from thalassemia intermedia. At present, hemoglobin A equals adult, or at presentation, I mean, hemoglobin F equals fetal and, and uh, RBC equals red blood cell. So you can see what the key means, and then we can look at thalassemia major more likely and thalassemia intermedia more likely. So the person's presentation in years, less than 2, greater than 2. Hemoglobin levels less than 7 or at 7 to 10. Liver spleen enlargement severe or moderate to severe. Hemoglobin F percent is greater than 50 or if it is 10 to 50. Okay, so this is just telling you how to differentiate between two of the two major thalassemias that are going to cause problems. The two major thalassemias that are going to cause problems. All right, let's see what's next. So in this slide, this is just an algorithmic approach to the examination of the full blood count. And I think this is a UK um, university slide. So they call it full blood count beside, instead of complete blood count. But you see here that if we see an MCV that's less than 80, 
we're thinking microcytic anemia and we're going to do some serum iron studies and low iron and ferritin with high TIBC we probably have iron deficiency anemia and low iron and ferritin with low TIBC we probably get anemia of chronic disease but if it goes down the center there and the MCV to RBC index which is called the Menser index and I don't you don't have to know that right now then we're thinking thalassemia so these are this is just an algorithmic approach to your different anemias algorithmic approach to your different anemias you can see over there if the MCV is greater than 100 we can follow that all the way down to alcohol abuse myelodysplastic syndromes and I was just telling someone in class today who asked me about the usefulness of the MCV the RDW MCHC all those things I was just instructing or advising I'm not, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what you'd call it I was suggesting that perhaps one way to approach the anemias and the diagnosis of anemias and the way to think about the CBC is to do a little backwards planning. Do a little back look. So if you were to say, okay, I have a condition. The condition is B12 deficiency or folate deficiency. Let's just go with B12 deficiency. Let's go backwards and try to think of the pathophysiology from a backwards perspective. And it might make it a little more useful in terms of understanding how the MCV became greater than 100. How did we end up with a macrocytic anemia instead of a microcytic anemia? So if we were to use our vitamin B12 deficiency and work backwards, what might we learn about the pathophysiology of vitamin B12 deficiency in terms of what, how it affects production and final product of our blood cell. So we would have to start with how do we make a blood cell and then we would have to consider all the components that go into making a good blood cell, one that's effective and perfect, and B12 would be one of those ingredients. So we would then work backwards to figure out why the red cell ended up macrocytic in response to not having enough vitamin B12. So I challenge you to um, exercise your brains with such a pursuit and see if it helps you to think about the anemias. The last slide, or maybe it's the next to the last slide, I can't remember. Again, we have our hemogro hemogram values and we're looking at MCVs and we can follow this uh, MCV less than 78 and we can see that it's iron deficiency, blood loss, dietary, lead intoxication, chronic disease, and whoop, there's our thalassemia.